morning. Um, thank you for the, the welcome you've given. It's good to be back here um, in Kelty um, once again. Um, as, I'm, as I come each year, um, my, my eyesight gets slightly worse. I'm relieved that I can actually read my notes here with my glasses. I'm getting to the point of very focal, so that kind of point in my life. Um, but hopefully my, my notes will be clear. Um, we're going to turn this morning and we're going to look at a passage um, in the book of Hebrews. Um, it really helpful if you've got your Bibles that you could turn there. Um, we're looking at Hebrews chapter 10 and a few verses from verse 19. And we're going to think this morning um, a little bit around um, the gospel. It's been really helpful already this morning, both in the community service and so far in the family service, to be focusing a bit around the gospel. And we're going to focus around what it's like to be within a community of believers um, and hopefully to be encouraging one another um, today as we do that. So we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 10 um, and a few verses from verse 19 onwards, which I'll just read just now. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place for the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So that's the passage that we're going to consider um, this morning together. And in many ways, um, it's a very simple passage, some very simple things here um, for us to be reminded of um, in our walk um, with God. We're going to start off just the first few verses, taking them together, um, and I've just given this first point the title, Confidence in the Finished Work of Christ. So I mentioned earlier we're going to be thinking a bit about the Gospel this morning, and particularly in this first point. I just want to reread those first few verses just so we have them in our minds, verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place with the blood of Jesus Christ, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from the guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. There's a mention at the start here about the most holy place, um, just in verse 19, towards the end of verse 19. I think it's important for us to understand what has been referred to um, by this most holy place. It's maybe not something that you would maybe immediately grasp today and um, today's culture. Certainly if you went out to the world, people wouldn't understand um, that concept. But this is referring back um, to, the, to the Old Testament, to, to the tabernacle, to the temple, um, and the holy of holies. Um, that place that could only be entered once a year by the high priest. And just maybe a couple of verses to help us um, with this um, from Hebrews chapter 9. There's a verse there that says, But only the high priest can enter the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. That's Hebrews 9, verse 7. So there's this idea that it's this place where God is. And once a year, the high priest is able to go in and to offer sacrifices, blood sacrifices, for the people's sin, once a year. And the implication here, the indication is this is a place where God is, and it's, it's holy, and we are not holy. And again, we've already thought about this morning, we've thought about our sin, and how our sin separates us from God, and we cannot just come into God's presence. There needs to be a way provided um, for us. We also read um, in the passage that we've got today about there being a curtain. Um, it talks about verse 20, through the curtain, and this re also relates back to this holy place. The holy place was separated from the rest of the temple, the rest um, of, of the tabernacle, 
by a thick curtain. And then we read about that in Matthew 27, verses 50 to 51. I'm thinking about Jesus dead and what happened after this curtain. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Matthew 27, 50 to 51. So when we read in verse 20 of our passage today, um, this new way opened for us through the curtain, I think that's relating back to what we read in the first verse about the most holy place, and this curtain that separates the holy place from the rest of the temple. So confidence to enter is a significant thing. So we speak about this confidence we have to enter the most holy place. It is a significant thing. It's not something that we should be taking for granted. We, as believers today, can often um, just motor along with life and take these things for granted and not pause and think. And we should be pausing to think. We should be pausing to think about the privilege that it is for us as believers <coughs> to be able to enter that holy place. Because the equivalent for us today is to come before God, direct to have access to God. We don't have to do it through a priest. We don't have to do it once a year. We can do it at any point. And it's because of what Christ has achieved through us when he died on the cross. In those verses we read about the curtain being torn in two when Jesus died on the cross very symbolic of that ready access that we have um, to God. But don't repent to take that um, for granted. And why is this such a significant thing? Because we are sinful. We are sinful people. Um, and sinful people cannot just come before God. We need to have Christ as our mediator. So the passage is telling us this. It's telling us we can have a confidence. We can have a boldness as we come into God's presence at any time, but not a boldness based on what we've done, but a boldness based on what Christ has done through the blood of Christ. So it's something to think about, it's something not to take um, for granted. So there's some indications here about how it's possible through the blood of Christ that mentions in our passage. It talks about a new and living way, again, referring back um, to Christ and what he's done, and it talks about through the curtain, and this idea of that curtain being torn when Jesus died for us. So let us draw near. Um, an implication, this is a new way of life. And it's not just something that is done occasionally, it's something that should be our lives as we're able to, to focus on Christ as believers. But you know, there's a clear gospel implication here in terms of what is that gospel? Now, as we come this morning, There'll be some of us who will be believers, some who maybe are not believers in Christ. And just pause briefly just now to explain a little bit about the gospel of Christ, because it's in this passage here. Um, but we have come um, into this world, we are born as sinners, um, we have done things that are wrong in our lives. And those things separate us from God. Um, the wrong things that we do in our lives separate us from God, and nobody is exempt from that. We are all sinners. And the only person who ever lived in this earth who was not a sinner was our Lord Jesus Christ. He lived that perfect life and he chose to lay down his life, taking the punishment for sin, not his sin, but the sin that we have committed. And it's through that death of Christ that has made it possible for us to have that relationship with him. And all that God requires of us, and we think back um, to the, the children's um, singing there earlier, <clears throat> the word if, if we believe, if we will come and believe. And that is all that is required of us to come into that relationship with God. If we believe in that work of Christ on the cross, taking the punishment for our sin, um, making it possible for us to come into that relationship with him, and if we will recognize our sin, if we will come and ask God for forgiveness and trust in Christ, we can know that our sins are forgiven and we can know that new life, that new way that is talked about um, in this passage. We, we live in an uncertain world. I don't need to, to tell you that. Um, we have come through a pandemic. We've come through um, a situation there which has affected our lives in, in dramatic ways. We've got a current situation with the war that's happened across in Ukraine. We've got a cost of living crisis, and that's just to mention a few things. It's an uncertain world. We don't know what is around the corner. If I was to ask you what is around the corner in 2023, we don't know. I don't know. We don't know, but one thing is clear from the Bible, that we should not expect an easy life that is free from trouble. That's pretty clear, and we've been reminded of that over recent years. But 
the Bible offers us a gospel that we can have confidence in, that we can have certainty in. And this is how our passage today started out. It talks about us having full assurance, having full confidence. So whilst there is a huge amount of uncertainty that's happening in our world just now, we can have certainty in Christ. Not certainty about our day-to-day -day circumstances, but certainty in our relationship with God and a future with him in heaven. And that is an amazing thing for us to be able to have a certainty about in the midst of what's happening in our lives and in our world. So let's move on to the next um, verse in our passage. Um, we're going to look at verse 23. Um, I'm talking about a consistent walk with him. Verse 23 says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. So the implication here about unswervingly is that we don't waver, um, that we don't come and go in our walk with him. How is this possible? The verse talks about a hope. And this indicates that it's something that we're looking forward to, but don't yet have a hope for the future. And we can do this as believers. Think back to what we've just seen during the Old Testament times that people didn't have direct access to God. This access was through the priest, and as we've already read, it was only once a year that he'd go into the Holy of Holies. But for ourselves, we have that access at any point, and we can come to God and we can draw strength from that. There are other things that we have that were not there for the Old Testament saints. We have a sure knowledge of Christ and what he has done. We have the full Bible available to us. We have the church. We have the church that God has provided for us where we can enjoy fellowship and encouragement in him. God has given us so much to allow us to hold unswervingly and to have a consistent walk with him. Just a verse from, from Hebrews, Hebrews well earlier in chapter 3, verse 6. But Christ is faithful as the son over God's house, and we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. So I focused here on what we should rely on, the things that he has given to us. We're sometimes led by our feelings. Um, and I think this is a mistake um, in, in our Christian walk that we are relying on our feelings. Yes, if we're going to be going, if things are going well in our lives, then we're going to feel good about that. We're going to feel as though things are going well. However, we should not be relying on that for our spiritual barometer and how well things are going for us. Our current circumstances often dictate how we're feeling, and these can change over time. So our focus in terms of how we are doing spiritually, and our confidence, our, our unswerving, as we read in the passage there, our, our swerving hope that we have is not about how we're feeling day to day. It's about the reality of what we read in the Bible, the reality of Christ and what he has done for us. And that's where we should be fixing our eyes at times when we maybe don't feel great about our spiritual walk. That's where our eyes should be to remind ourselves of those truths of the gospel, those truths that we have in the Bible. And if you notice the end of verse 23, it says, for he who promised is faithful. Um, and that is the big picture. It's not about us and our faithfulness, it's about him and his faithfulness to us. For he who promised is faithful. God has made a promise and he is faithful and to carry that through. Whilst it's true that we need faith regarding our future hope, there is a lot that we do have now and can give us confidence in that hope. We have his word, we have prayer, we've already spoken about how we can come into his presence at any stage in prayer. We have his word, we have prayer, and we have fellowship with his people. And that is a key thought in this passage that we'll come on to again later, um, fellowship with his people. And it's not just about what we do in our own homes, about our prayer times and our Bible times in our own homes, but it's about those coming together in fellowship with his people. So these things God has given to us to help us to be unswerving, as we read in the passage. We're asked to be unswerving in the hope that we profess, and we can do that by taking the things that God has given to us. Rely on what he has given us, and don't make it up ourselves. Don't have it as a self-run um, Christian. 
So if we're relying on feelings, then our hope will waver depending on how life is going, how we are feeling that time. And we do see this in some Christian traditions, a focus on feelings and emotions, whipping those emotions up. Emotions are relevant, and indeed if our hope is built on solid foundations, then our feelings and our emotions will be affected in a positive way. However, there are times that are tough, and we need to be able to come back to those realities of the Christian faith, those firm foundations that we have in the Bible. So if we move on to verse 24 now, um, and I'm just calling this point, this third point, consider others in verse 24. And as I read this, I'm reminded the Christian life is not one of isolation. It's not one of isolation, but a fellowship is not one of muddling through on my own, but of treading often difficult journey with others with mutual encouragement. It's not a journey where we will automatically gravitate towards love and good deeds, but one where we need to be spurred on to live like that. So when we read in verse 24, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, this is bringing in this angle of fellowship and God's people coming together and to help us in these things. Do you know the blessing that it is when facing tough times to be able to go to another believer or a group of believers and talk it through, knowing that they can give you a perspective that no unbeliever can, as they bring a Christian spiritual perspective to the situation, to the issue that you're dealing with. They can also pray for you. They can bring scripture into the situation in a way that you maybe can't if you're so absorbed with the issue that you're currently facing. Or maybe it's the blessing of a close-knit group of believers, for example, maybe in a home group setting, where you can share openly, knowing that the people who are there care for you and you care for them. There's a mutual concern and prayer with a focus on his word. We can only be blessed in these ways or be a blessing to others if we're part of what is happening in our local group of believers. So don't sit on the sidelines, be involved. When the verse says, consider how, as a starting point to be involved in the lives of others, this will open up many ways to serve others as we're aware of their needs and struggles. And we can also share our needs and struggles. So don't be an isolated believer. Don't be a believer that is stepping back and trying to do it on your own. Um, God has given us the church. During the period of COVID, um, we, like many others, we had a particular tough situation in, in our family um, circle. And it was really, really good to be able to go and to meet with others in our home group. Um, in that context, it was outside in the freezing cold around the fire pit. Um, you don't have to do that to smell, but that was, I, I've got very clear memories of myself, my wife Debbie, um, going and, and meeting with another couple in the garden around the fire pit, it started to rain, it was cold. But it was such a blessing to be able to go to talk through um, the issue that we were working through in our family, um, to know that they were praying for us, um, not to be proud, not to be scared, to be able to go and have that open conversation. Even if it's only a small trusted group, it doesn't have to be the things that you're, you're dealing with shared amongst the whole church. Um, that is one of the blessings that we have where we can go to a small group and it does make a real difference. It makes a real difference being able to share um, with others. So I would encourage you to be involved in that way and to be open. Um, I think sometimes when we're not open, we give the impression that everything is absolutely fine in our lives. And that can be actually quite discouraging for others um, who are maybe struggling and thinking that everyone else has it sorted. But I think if we can be vulnerable and exposed and we can be talking about the issues and we can be seeking help from others, I think that's not only help for ourselves, but it's also help for others in the church. So we should be considering others how we should be spurring each other on in love and good deeds. And then in verse 25, We've got the verse there, which I'm going to call this last point, coming together. And it says in verse 25, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So this is me just wrapping up this idea of um, 
meeting together. It's coming out through these passages in verse, verse 25 really does bring us back to this point about not giving up meeting together. In some ways, it's very straightforward, but it's also something that Christians can neglect. We should regularly meet together with other believers in a church context with the aim of encouraging each other. That's what we're asked to do in this passage. It's not legalism, so it's not having to be every single thing that the church puts on. It's also recognising within a church context that we have gifts and we're asked to use those gifts for the benefit of others. Um, so again, that would add to the fact that it's not been necessarily everything that's happening. But it is about commitment and it is about regularly meeting with other believers to worship and to serve our God. Not because you have to, but because you want to. Because you recognise that benefit for yourself. But more than that, you recognise that benefit for others, how you can input into others' lives. The pattern is set for us in the book of Acts, and just a couple of verses from Acts just to reinforce this. As we look at the book of Acts, we've got the starting point there of the church. Um, we've had the situation where um, the apostles are, are grappling with how to take forward um, the gospel of Christ in a context where Jesus is no longer with them. And we have the starting of the church there, and Acts 1.14 says, they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And Acts 2.42 says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. There are just two verses in the early chapters in Acts. I could list a whole pile of other verses there in Acts, which talk about believers coming together, um, often in our home context, but coming together with other believers um, to encourage each other, to build each other up, and to come and to worship God. I've heard um, the following types of comments too often um, from other believers. Comments like, I don't need to go to church, as I have a personal relationship with Jesus. Or, I've been hurt too many times by Christians to go to church. Or I don't get anything out of church anymore, so I don't go. Those are all comments that I have heard from other believers, and they trouble me um, because of what we've been speaking about today. The pandemic has been very interesting <coughs> in this regard. Um, we had um, a period of time um, where we were prevented from gathering for long periods. And I'm not this morning going to go into the rights and wrongs of that and what will that how that came about. But that was the reality of it. We were prevented from coming together. And in that situation, some people haven't returned um, to in-person worship, and that's sad. And although every situation is different, and I'm not judging, as a rule, we should hold our in-person church as something that's very precious for us, something that God has given to us. We've learned from the pandemic that some <coughs> of what we can do virtually is really helpful, but it's not a replacement for in-person. So, for example, at Trubbers, we held an online prayer meeting um, late last year. Um, I, I, I agonised a little bit over it, you know, do we do it online? But we did it online because we had our missionaries joining in, and it was a much better opportunity for them to be involved in it and be involved in the prayer groups that we had. But that was an exception um, rather than the rule. We continue to live stream our services, and that's helpful with those who can't make an app because they're sick, or it's actually really helpful as well for our missionaries around the world who maybe don't have fellowship in their context and they can come in and they can join our services. But we encourage people to join us in person wherever possible. I know you've got online um, even services here, and that's great because it allows a wider range of speakers to be able to bring teaching and to use a fellowship. But it's fantastic that you're meeting in the morning in person and encouraging each other in that way. So we have got, there was somebody I was speaking to um, a few times um, over the last year, somebody who didn't return to our services after the COVID restrictions were relaxed for a good period of time. Um, I met with this person a couple of times um, over the past year. He seemed happy enough to join the online services, but at the end of last year, he came back in person. Um, and it was only coming back in person that really brought home to him what he had missed by not having that in-person fellowship. There were parts of online church that appealed to me, probably more of the lazy part um, of that, not having to travel. We've got that half an hour journey into Crubbers on a Sunday morning. 
um, and the evening we go out for evening service. Um, being able to get Sunday lunch early ready. So you know, I think our girls were very appreciative of that, the fact that we would have lunch really early on Sunday because we could do it between the morning live stream and the call we had with our home group and the potatoes were in and all the rest of it. Um, there were things there which the lady part of me really gravitated to and, and having done that for a long period thinking, how can we go back to having to travel in and having lunch late and all the rest of it. But those things soon sort themselves out once we were able to get back into in-person services. And now I just cannot imagine the prospect of going back to fully online. Let's hope we don't have to, to go there. So there are real blessings of meeting together in person with God's people. So don't fall into the mistake um, that meeting together is not important. God has set this pattern for us as believers. It's not something that your church leaders have come up with. This is God that has come up with a pattern for us meeting together. I and mean, that's clear throughout the New Testament. The church isn't perfect. We're all in the church. And I have sympathy for people. I mentioned there the situation where somebody's maybe in church because they've been hurt. And that's very real and that's very hard. Um, but we should be gathering together. Um, Recognise that it's not perfect. Um, we should be involved. And as the passage says, we should be coming together, seeking to encourage one another in our faith in the Lord Jesus. The verse um, at the end says about as we see the day approaching. And this is a somber reminder for us, and we've already thought a bit about this today, a reminder that what we have now is not forever. However, however, what we have just now is good for us as believers to encourage each other we're looking forward to that day when all the imperfect will be taken away and what we'll have will be perfect fellowship in the presence of our Lord forever. And this should encourage us to keep going, to keep going in him. So we've looked today um, in our passage um, about having a confidence in the finished work of Christ. We thought about what the gospel was, what Christ achieved, thinking about the, the Holy of Holies, the curtain being torn, and that symbolism there of our ready access to Christ that we have um, through what Christ has done for us. We then thought about a consistent walk with him, being unswerving in a walk with him. We thought about considering others um, and coming together to consider, other, to, to consider others before ourselves and not neglecting um, our responsibility to come together as we're advised in this passage, as we're commanded in this passage, um, not to neglect our coming together um, as believers to seek to serve and to worship him. So as we close, I just want to, to bring this together by reading the passage through again. As we've thought about these things, as I read the passage, just think through some of the things we've brought out this this morning, and hopefully that'll be an encouragement to you. So from verse 19, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that, that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Let's pray. <coughs> Lord, we come to you this morning, and we are thankful for this time together. We're thankful for the opportunity that we have um, to meet. Thank you for the blessing of your church. Thank you for um, the blessing of being able to be together, to be able to worship you, to be able to hear from your word. And thank you for the blessing it is to be able to um, talk with each other and to be able to encourage each other. And Lord, I just pray that you would just bless us as we, um, as we talk now, as we have fellowship together, and as we see this action, as we seek to share what is happening in each other's lives and to be able to encourage each other as we do that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>